Let's have a little dose of reality and a dose of what lockdown is doing as we hear so many people, ministers and MPs say, well, we need to be cautious about coming out of lockdown because, you know, we want to be careful about people's health and, and people's lives. Well, let's talk to another one of our fabulous listeners who've been brave enough to get in touch uh, to talk about uh, what lockdown has meant to them and the real effect of these policies. Uh, and let's welcome uh, Jane. Uh, good morning to you. Oh, hi. Good morning. Hi, now, I said, now, the, the pause there was, of course, Jane is, is the name we're calling you today. You're not using your real name uh, because um, of, of your family, not aware of all of the circumstances of what you've been through this year. Um, yeah. Tell us tell us what's happened to you during lockdown. Oh, we've been trying for a second baby for a long time. And after an early loss three months before, this one seemed to be sticking and we couldn't, yeah. I couldn't help myself but feel excited. Um, I had my first scan on the 15th of June. My husband drove us and we had a letter to say that he wouldn't be allowed to come in. But I thought that when we got to the door, I don't know, I just thought oh, maybe they would, wouldn't would be that strict. Yeah. But anyway, so he had to wait in the car park um, while I went in, which I was obviously really disappointed because he wouldn't get to see the baby. Yeah. And then there was hardly anyone around, so it didn't really make sense. Um, but he wouldn't be able to come in for something so important. Um I mean, obviously, you know, there's always a chance that things might not go well, but I didn't yeah. really believe that that would be the case. Um, during the scan, the sonographer was just taking a really long time to find the baby. Um, and then I began to panic, and um, they finally told me that it stopped developing. And there was a second opinion from somebody else. Mm. Um, my mind just went blank for questions. I just felt overwhelmed, and they were... Um, as they were talking and looking at the screen, I'm just lying there with that face, my face mask on. But it was that point that I just really needed my husband. Yeah, you went through that on your own. Um, I, I, I lost four babies, uh, four miscarriages, and two of them I found out about at, at the 12 week scan. I know exactly mm. what that's like, and um, I've, I'm, I've been. I've been through that exact experience, but on both of those occasions, I had my husband there with me, and we were able to comfort each other. Um, and to get through it together uh, at the moment when you discover that you know it's 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 not a, you know it's not a not a little blob of blood vessels is it it's it's a much loved yeah, much I mean, wanted child it's hard for anyone get, you know having to go through that mm. it just felt really wrong to have to to do it alone cause yeah. I was um, put in a room I must have been there about half an hour just sitting in a room on my own waiting <sighs> for some paperwork and all I just knew was my husband was out in the car park and I had to. I had to go and break the news to him. You didn't. You didn't call him. You waited to tell him in person. Yeah, I told him in person. Yeah. Oh. He's a bit rubbish with his phone, so he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. And it's the sort of news you need to. I mean, again, you've already had a child. You'd already lost one child at a at miscarriage. So this was this was something you just so you'd fought for. You were desperately. Hoping for. I mean. <laughs> That's incredibly hard. And, and we know that that's been the policy. One of the things we fought against in the last few months is to allow uh, partners to be attending scans, to be uh, attending um, a, the full birth and not leave mums on their own. It's such a, even at a joyful time, you want your other half there. But at a, when things yeah, go wrong. Right. baby too as well. So it's like, you know, they're right. What, you was, know. what was his reaction about, when you told him? Right. Well, he just had, had me in the car and he was brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so. I'm yeah, it was so, brilliant. I'm, but I'm so sorry you had to go through that. Um, mm. I mean, you've also been been dealing with your, your grandmother has been in a care home since before lockdown, and yeah, and so you've she, been trying to help her as well. Well, she was um, living in a care home down the road from me. <clears throat> She'd only been there a few months before lockdown, and I visited her regularly after work with my then two year old son. Um, but she loved. Um, seeing him as yeah. did all the other residents and um, he always came back with chocolate and biscuits because <laughs> they all loved to see him and um, there's always someone from our family that visited her every day and she just lit up when she saw you you know mm -hmm. um, and of course we were no longer allowed to see her because of lockdown and um, she never saw my son again and I only saw her once through a window and a few times you know, on video calls which weren't very successful. Yeah. Um, she died four weeks ago oh, um, so at the great age of 98. Um, COVID did get into the home two weeks before the residents were scheduled to receive the vaccine. Mm. Um, but she officially died of old age and frailty and COVID was put as a secondary cause on her death certificate. 
she did officially kind of recover, but it had weakened her so much. Um, but my mum and I just feel angry about her last year because we feel just a lot of guilt. But you, I mean, you've, you've, I mean, I know lots of families feel that the guilt that they can't see their loved ones, but and and certainly not there for the last months of of their lives. But uh, and it's so difficult because often those those elderly people in camps don't understand why they're not getting visits from their loved ones. But you know, this is the thing. This is something imposed on you. You've done everything you can, and oh God, I don't, I don't, my heart, just, it's. This is the, this is this is the reality of what these policies mean, doesn't it? It's families, it's families torn apart. It, it's 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 people not being able to have those relationships that that make life worthwhile. I know. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, yeah. The isolation and loneliness she experienced in her last year is quite hard to accept because after everything that we all went through to protect her, she got it anyway. Yeah. She was ninety eight, and she wasn't worried about death. She just wanted her family around her um, but that valuable time you know, was stolen from all of us you know? it, was, it was quite hard yeah. I, I, I can hear it in your voice um, I think everyone right now is listening and wants to if, when we're allowed to I want to give you a really big hug um, for getting <laughs> to it but really brave of you to tell your story um, and to, to share with, with everybody um, and if there's one thing I could just advise just in terms of, of, of what you've been through in terms of the pregnancy do share it with your family and friends because they would like to know and they would like to be able to comfort you and I know that's what uh, we had with our family that actually you know people you know people do want to know and and, and, and you know that baby was just as real um, you know it, I, I've been there myself and I do I do I do feel what you've gone through um, I'm sure everyone's sending you really big love right now thank you for sharing your story and just look after yourself look after your little one and and don't feel any guilt about a policy that's separated your family through no fault of your own um, we're, we're on your side and and thank you very much for sharing